Hey, everybody. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm filling in for Camille for today. Um, but the topic is going to be uh, how to get back into the swing of singing if you haven't done it in a while. Uh, essentially, you know, it's really understandable, especially as a teacher. I hear a lot of people are like, I'm so sorry I haven't practiced or I you know, had something else going on for a while. It's totally normal. I just like to remind people that we come in and out of our practices. And that's actually sometimes a healthy thing to be able to take a break from what you're doing and life happens, you know, work, health things. There's all sorts of reasons why we uh, get out of our practice and get out of the swing of things. And then, you know, it calls you again. And so you you feel that inkling and it's like, okay, I want to dive back into this practice. Uh, and so that's what this one is all about. It's just sort of how do you do that process? And what are some of the things that uh, people run into in terms of issues as they're trying to kind of get back to where they used to be, you know? So I think the main concept here is just like Every other lesson I'd like to mention that singing and being a singer is it's an athletic endeavor. And so it takes some time to get back into shape. And oftentimes a lot of our injuries and issues that we have are mainly just because we're trying to rush the process and we remember sort of where we used to be and we're not really checking in with where we are currently. Uh, so I'm always like patience, less is more. We try to manipulate things when things aren't quite going the way that we want to. And then we start developing bad habits. On the other side of this, if you haven't been singing in a while, it's a great opportunity to build things back up from the very beginning uh, to really get a sensation of, uh, you know, get a sense of what all the sensations are and where they are now with your body. Um, so it's a great time to talk about the practice again. I know sometimes it's a little bit like being a broken record. Um, there's a reason why I sort of designed the practice the way that I do because I know that we come in and out of this and we want sort of a process to check in with our voice and kind of stimulate it to be in the right place so that it's working for us and that we're not trying to muscle our way through it too much. Uh, so that's the general concept. I always like to build a framework of like, what are our intentions here? What's the, the general idea for the course? Um, so, you know, uh, also please feel free uh, to mention things in the comments. Um, let me know things that you come across because again, some of these things, uh, when we haven't been singing in a while, like there's certain little things that come up and I'm going to talk about them that can be a disconcerting or like, Oh no, that's not really working appropriately. And it's just a matter of having the right kind of process. And also knowing that other people experience that, including professional singers, uh, we're always checking in with our voice and saying, Oh, that was a weird little thing that happened there, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the goal for today. Um, and you know, the main, again, the main principle is that if we haven't been singing in a while, we're going to be a little out of shape. It's hard to feel the muscles, uh, in our whole singing system in general. And so we tend to try and use other muscles thinking that we're helping our voice along, but we're actually rushing it and then potentially creating some habits, uh, some tension and some strain when we really just need to coax the voice back into place and efficiency. And it's a much lighter feeling than what most people think most of the time. Right. So. Um, let's start with the first process, right? You know, if you're getting back into singing, the first thing you want to think about your muscles here, you know, your shoulders, your neck, your head, making sure you're doing your stretch routine, right? This is always the first part of my practice is to just gain some body awareness. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit of physical exercise. It takes some, um, like light tapping can be a nice thing, shaking things out, certainly trying to get some spinal mobility, twisting around, um, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. And this is a very, very common thing, right? We we remember, um, just responding to the comment here, you know, we remember what we used to be like. And when we're out of shape, that can be a frustrating thing because it's like, oh man, I've lost a lot of this, you know, a lot of that endurance and strength and flexibility. Uh, and I just remind people that the more times that you do this and you build it up from scratch again, you know, because we get sick, things come up and we have to deal with those things. And ultimately, they actually help us with our singing and our art in general, because we have to have a life outside of our own, you know, specific practice. Um, so chance to explore things. But yeah, we often feel this sort of, um, oh, no, you know, like I, it, you know, things aren't the way that they used to be. And so that's always, always the case. Um, it's just a process and we come in and out of our seasons and things like that. So um, yeah, so first thing, right, check in with your body, get some spinal mobility. That's for everybody all the time, anytime you're doing a vocal practice. Um, so, but let's talk about kind of how we, we get our breath going. How do we condition our muscles and sort of what this process should be like? 
So the first one, um, a thing that people are going to come across if they haven't been singing in a while, uh, is you're going to feel out of breath, right? You're going to feel like, oh, I'm not using my breath appropriately. And this leads to one type of technique thing that happens all the time. People try to take a really full kind of big breath, right? And in some ways that actually slows us down and it actually inhibits our natural breath. So this is what's so tricky about singing is we, we want to stimulate our body into a certain state. So it's happening naturally. And if you're trying to pull in air by one um, squeezing muscles here or anything where you're trying to actually pull it with your throat, that's going to be an issue. Um, and it often is because, again, we don't do diaphragmatic breathing all the time, right? A lot of times we're just breathing up here. We call this clavicular breathing, right? Breathing from this top area up and down. Um, and so again, like a broken record, it takes actually some work to get your diaphragmatic breathing going, Ex letting your belly relax and expand like that. You see my shoulders don't really lift that much. And that's actually exercising uh, your diaphragm. It's indirect, right? We By relaxing our abdominal muscles, letting our belly and our back expand, our diaphragm gets active and then it relaxes and then it gets active. So we're doing kind of little push-ups for our diaphragm. So again, it might seem really simple, but if you're just sitting here and focusing on deep breathing, you're going to be helping your voice. And I recommend if you haven't been singing in a while, you're going to want to do this for a little more time. So I just sit here and I use that breath. And here's this weird game of try not try. So I, yes, I want to keep sinking into my breath, but I have to work myself into a flow. Uh, and so this is allowing the breath to be kind of shallow at first. And then eventually you're going to start to kind of hack into your system. Your breath is going to start working on its own. So I always like to use these sort of active passive terms, like try to see if you can get your body to breathe you rather than trying to like expand your breath by forcing your body into a certain position. So it's, it's a weird concept, but you actually have to sit with it. This is why I slow people down and try to work into a flow at the same time as we do this diaphragmatic breath we can use the exhale to start relaxing our face muscles, right? So this is uh, where we get a lot of tension. It's often from other things we're doing too, right? So you might find like how you're talking, um, the stress in your life, exercise, and these other things are going to actually lead to a lot of extra tension. And these muscles are just like extra live, right? They're turned on. And so it's taking some time to deep breathe. We can... Start to let these muscles drop on the exhale and feel some of that warm air. Um, get into a flow like this. Turn it into a meditation. And you're actually strengthening your breath system so that it works better for you. Um, let's go to the next step, right? So let's see. we want to start to get a little extra resistance, right? We want to get our breath support starting to go again. Um, this is where we're going to want to do some of these tricks to stimulate the body. So um, some of them are simple, like blowing against your hand, creating some res manual resistance is sort of what I call this. So I'm really trying to create a seal here. And then I go. And I'm going to feel actually these lower abdominal muscles engaged. So I'm just trying to get that feeling again, right? Because our muscle memory is going to drift. If you haven't been singing in a while, it's just going to be all murky again. So this is why we started up this way. So you can also do the hissing exercise, right? This is like a TS syllable with your tongue, your lips, and your teeth. And again, we're creating kind of like a seal here. Just a tiny bit of air can escape. And we can go. So we're just feeling that muscle flex. This isn't exactly what it's like when we're singing, but we're stimulating the muscle. So it's important to note that we're just trying to get our body sort of awake in the right way and get some muscle isolation. So that's our breath support. When we add more pressure here, it helps our voice go up. When we relax and we let our air out, it helps our voice go down. And so this is that support mechanism. Um, you can also do, uh, this is something I added in last week. You can think about like a belly laugh and you're also going to get the same kind of stimulation. So if I'm like, it's not like um, too maniacal, but also kind of a deep, full laugh. And you're going to go like, ha, 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 ha. Super weird sounding, I know, because uh, we associate these things with it. But I'm actually just going for the feeling, right? So like, ha, 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 ha. And again, ha, 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 ha. I'm getting that engagement there. So this is how we're learning to resist airflow. Um, it creates a backup of pressure. And this is essentially what we sing on. So um, 
it's really, really great to get these muscles active and ready. It's going to help sort of circumvent that issue that I mentioned, which is you're starting to sing again, you're going into your songs and you're feeling yourself running out of breath. And then what happens is we feel ourselves not using our breath efficiently. We start to squeeze and push from our upper abdominal muscles. And that can be a, an issue. You're going to start to feel like you're kind of suffocating. Everything's kind of coming in like this. So the trick really is to just get your body to do it for you. So little exercises like this actually go a really long way. Um, so I'm doing like blowing against my hand, trying to get that stimulation in my belly and my back. Ha, 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 ha. Things like that also work. Uh, and eventually you can just take a nice big breath. And go. you know, eventually let it go. It's not about taking it to the very end, right? Because if we're doing that, then we're uh, essentially teaching ourselves to hold on to the air instead of getting our body to naturally create some efficiency by just kind of dropping and sinking into our breath. So that's that first thing you're going to want to do um, a good amount of that kind of work. And it's just going to help you make sure that you're not um, you're not squeezing and um, that's going to be a really, really helpful part of the process. So again, this is why I do this practice sort of in this order. It's sort of like microsecond to microsecond. What are we doing when we sing? First, we're standing there and we're in a good posture and we're relaxed. And then we breathe low. And then we start to engage and resist some air pressure resist some air and create some pressure. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's that first thing. Um, there's also, you know, if you do a gentle cough, like <coughs> you're going to also feel that muscle engage. There's a number of little tricks using a, a singing straw. It's also going to help you get that. Um, so let's get to the next concept. Uh, so sometimes when we're starting to sing and we haven't done it in a while, this kind of, these two go together. When we start actually adding our voice, we'll get a couple different things. And you may have seen this or felt this before. Um, either, yeah, it's too soft where air is escaping, right? That means we need to just get a little more activity in our belly and our back. Um, but sometimes we also get this other thing where it's jittery or it kind of like feels like you can't quite get it to smooth out, right? It's so your voice kind of lurching or kicking against you and it creates kind of an instability in pitch. Um, it's disconcerting. It feels very like awkward at first. Um, and so I think what happens again is a lot of people, include myself included, when we feel this, we start to try and manipulate it and start squeezing with muscles and it's wrap you know rather we actually just have to allow the body to start to adjust and so i'll do humming style exercises and this actually helps to stabilize the muscles helps us get the right kind of compression with our vocal folds again we don't have to consciously do too much except be in the positions and that's again it's sort of like a yoga thing right we have to go through the practice and that helps condition the muscles uh sometimes when we're trying too hard we're actually kind of setting ourselves back. So especially if you haven't been singing in a while, start it with this process and it'll actually speed you up in the long run because you're not gonna have all of those habits of trying to manipulate the voice. So the next thing that I'll do right, is this kind of thing. I'm doing a hum and I'm gently moving my tongue up and around. We'll talk about that a little later. If you've seen any of my other courses, you'll know kind of what I'm doing there. But again, there's a lot of science behind humming and why the, the resonance um, when we hum actually helps our vocal folds stay stable. So it's just kind of like, just do that. And um, the most important thing that you can think about consciously is where is there a sweet spot? You might find that the first time you start doing this, it's raspy, um, it's unclear. You don't have a solid sense of sinking into anything. Um, and again, we start to try and push. Uh, but really, you just have to kind of sit with it and then gently kind of move around. Like, ask yourself, like, if I'm singing here, mm, does that feel higher? Do I feel like I can actually relax down to a slightly lower place? And eventually, you're going to find a sweet spot where the body starts to kind of take over. So that's really what's going on a lot of the time, I'm sort of shifting around. Mm, The other thing is immediately when we start singing, we often, you know, you probably saw it for a second for me even, we immediately kind of sometimes get stuck in a certain kind of alignment. So I just try to watch for that and then go back to that first concept of moving my head around, making sure that I have mobility here. Um, so, and that'll help you kind of turn your attention more to your belly and your back again. So doing this kind of thing. Mm.
your guide here is that you're going to hear that kind of ringy laser beamy sound that's the resonance it means that it's opening up and things are doing the you know things are lining up in the right way um, you're going to feel that kind of buzzy sort of warm sensation as everything starts to kind of relax and the external muscles that shouldn't be involved start to detach from the process so yeah it is it's kind of like a little chant and i sort of almost sing to myself uh internally using the overtones uh, and that's actually our vowel shapes ultimately, and it's a great way to stretch things. Yeah, exactly. Really pay attention to the sensations. Um, ah, okay. So interesting question here. Um, when you say nasal breathing, uh, it's sort of, I have a question about it because essentially I just tell people yes and no. You can breathe through your nose and your mouth, It's but it's really that we're breathing from our belly actually. So it's more of like a pressure system. I think when anyone thinks of breathing through the nose or the mouth, you, you run the risk of going like, or anything like that. We're using muscles and they're actually kind of squeezing and then it creates an irritation in the throat. So really I'm actually trying to keep this very detached. I call this sort of the neutral larynx breath. Everything is relaxed here. And I go, and I'm pulling it in posturally through my, through my abdominal muscles actually, right? By letting them take space, it brings the diaphragm flat and that pulls the air into our body. So that's really the whole concept here. Um, it's both really, um, you know, if you're, if you're going like, you're breathing more probably through your mouth, if you're going, you're breathing more through your nose. And that's, I really just say, let the air just come in wherever it can, um, you know, drink it in. But it's, again, we're not pulling from our throat. So, uh, yes, I, you know, the answer is it's, it's better to do diaphragmatic breathing in general because it's going to relax the facial muscles here so that they can just operate with what they need to be doing, right? Like our vocal folds need to be free and relaxed. And if we do this kind of stuff, we run the risk of irritating it. Um, you create sort of a fast air that uh, it's, it's sort of cooling and drying and it can cause people to start coughing. And this actually is a great segue. It's funny how this happens. Um, but it's a process and a practice. Uh, to the next concept is if you haven't been singing in a while, you might notice little crackles, little pops, um, mucus, right? So that's it's a gross thing, but we get flack on our vocal folds. And if we haven't been singing in a while, we're used to kind of speaking in a certain range. So we're going to have uh, stuff in certain places that accumulate as the vocal folds are starting to kind of work in a more dynamic way. And so you're going to get... Um, you're going to get some stuff coming out. And so part of doing this humming and droning thing is not only to help sort of stabilize our breath support muscles to work against that lurchy thing, right? Where it's like, uh, that kind of a thing that happens. It's hard to almost imitate because it's a very physical process, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. eventually I start going through glides, like ya, and wa, e, a, a, o, and u are major vowels. Uh, and by working through them, we're essentially creating different kinds of resonance. And that just helps to gently massage the vocal folds and get stuff off. So you'll notice you start singing this for like a few minutes and all of a sudden things start coming out that you wouldn't necessarily recognize. Some of it is also we're opening and relaxing our sinuses. Um, and so it's great to actually kind of deal with that early. It depends on the person in your body chemistry. If you have allergies, um, what you've been doing, sleep, hydration, all of these kinds of things. But generally, if you haven't been singing in a while, uh, you're going to have probably more of this. Uh, not, necess not necessarily, but you, you probably will. Uh, and what happens, uh, <laughs> this is a good question. I'm a, I'll get to that one in a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, so what happens is um, we, we start to kind of flinch or hold on to it because we get this sort of awkward sensation in our throat. And so it's a similar principle, right? Like when we have like a little bit of grit in our, our vocal folds, we sometimes start to kind of squeeze because it, you know, it, when it comes out, it can make, you know, the voice can stop. It can make some like uncomfortable, slightly awkward sounds. That's why we do this practice, you know, uh, before we start working on songs and things like that. So we, we can feel what it's like when everything is clean and clear in there. Um, so I'll do this process. I'll be like, yeah, 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 wah, 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 wah. right. I'm just trying to show you here. There's like a little bit of stuff and I'm like, and it'll start to kind of clear off 
The next thing you want to do is a, what I call um, a breath cough using your diaphragm to help you uh, create a little bit of air pressure that helps to kind of clear things off. So we don't want to grind. We don't want to like <clears throat> anything like that. Instead, <clears throat> I'm really just using. <clears throat> so it's also actually a way to help connect you to your diaphragm as well or to your um, support mechanism. <clears throat> um, and then I'm going to swallow. Seems simple, but we forget sometimes actually that swallowing is really helpful to reset the mechanism. We swallow and we go through the process again. Like, eventually we get smooth muscle function here. So sometimes, you know, when we talk, it's very visual. So we're used to throwing our kind of mouth around and our tongue. Uh, when we sing, it's much more delicate, actually. So we want to be like, yeah, get this to be really fluid and loose and relaxed. Often when we hear sort of a resonance that we don't like, we tend to sort of lock. Um, and so I just encourage you to explore the sounds, make some funny sounds, get some sounds going through your nose, you know, all of these kinds of things, and make sure that you're keeping your head mobile. Um, okay, I'm going to answer that diaphragm thing. Um, should we do diaphragmatic breathing for life or just when we sing? It's a really interesting question. I would say it's um, a combination of both kinds of breathing are really helpful. So I don't think that it's like clavicular breathing is bad. In fact, um, in some ways it takes less energy and we get more oxygen. So if we're like, <laughs> that's why, you know, if you think about like when we're out of breath, we tend to do this sort of panting thing. Although um, I would say when we do deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, uh, there's a, a number of studies about how this helps us get into a parasympathetic state, which is essentially just a rest and digest sort of relaxed state. And so I think we're going to alternate between diaphragmatic and clavicular breathing throughout our life. And you might find moments when a deep belly breath is going to be really helpful for you to clear your mind, channel some energy. Sometimes, right, when we're exercising too, in general, right, we want to have some of that sort of deeper breath, we can um, sometimes control our energy in a, in a better way. But I wouldn't necessarily say like, you should never do clavicular breathing. I think that might make for two, uh, uh, it's just a different kind of breath, you know, too concerted of a breath in other situations. Like I always have this joke with people, if, you know, if I breathe like this throughout the day, it'd be like, hi, how's it going? You know, there's this feeling of like, this manual moment to kind of engage that and people might be like, are you doing all right? You know, because sometimes that's when we're trying to calm and relax ourselves in certain ways. So I think diaphragmatic breathing is very, very helpful, but I don't think you should force yourself to do that all the time. I just think that it's something that we have to consciously practice more. Um, so that's going to be really helpful. And again, singing breath is a little different from some of the other kinds of breaths that we might do like uh, in yoga, like we have that sort of like, um, like a, it sounds like sort of the ocean when people are going like, It's a very soothing kind of breath. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you're kind of containing the heat in a certain way. But again, that's for a different practice. So uh, for a singing breath, we want this whole area to be very, very relaxed. And so again, it's not that those breaths are bad. It's just not while you're singing. You, you want to kind of associate this sort of feeling of everything being loose. And letting it all kind of relax as well on the exhale so that we don't get in the way of our vocal folds. Um, just no, you know, the reason I'm doing this in a slow process is because our vocal folds are very small. And when we sing, they're moving hundreds of times per second. So we often can fatigue ourselves rather quickly. Uh, and so we're working on ways to kind of get ourselves into the right state for muscle isolation. And then you're going to be able to sing on your voice longer and longer. And once you've trained that muscle memory, um, you, can, you can sing a lot, right? And, and people are very confused as to why. Um, it's mainly just because we're being very, very careful about not engaging or muscling uh, in the wrong way. So you know, we, need to do the, we need to do sort of glides and things like that. We need to find a sweet spot in our voice, nice and low, where we can feel the voice kind of take over and everything feels very relaxed. Uh, and we kind of draped down, at least in this sort of cervical spine area. Down here in your belly and your back, you might feel a little bit of activity, right? That's, that's the game. The feeling and perception does change though. So a lot of times we associate doing a good job with feeling more. Um, and really, we actually have to just pay attention, uh, you know, like feeling more like muscles engaging. We have to pay attention more to the feeling of freedom uh, and actually just listen and record ourselves and, and hear back 
oh, if I can do it that way and it feels like barely anything's happening, then that's that's going to be the better way to do it. Um, so another thing you can do uh, is our gentle sirens. So I, I think there's, a, you know, another one of these jokes is like sometimes you'll see people warming up or like in a group setting and they're like, let's do a siren. And everyone goes like, Ooh! and they just kind of like shriek it out. Um, and that is not helpful <laughs> for our voice either. I think of sirens as also kind of another way to stretch the mechanism, right? Our vo vocal folds are going from thick and then they're kind of pulling back and getting thinner. So do gentle sirens round up slowly over time. You might go like, and the main point is we're starting to actually practice our support feeling, right? In order to go up, I'm pushing down with my belly and my back. And that and that's really the um it maps backwards. That's really the most important thing. If you're going uh, and following it, you're artificially sort of trying to create the pressure up here versus uh, uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's just to really bring that point home. Um, so we're, we're kind of pairing this up. Uh, you can also use, you know, if you find going straight to a vowel is really hard, you can use any of these SOBT style exercises, right? Really great when you're starting up and it's been a while because it just quickly gets the right muscles engaged um, and helps you isolate them. So and strengthen them. So we're like thinking about like a Z, for example, going like that's also going to help you stimulate those muscles. Uh, even again, if it feels kind of a little strange, just doing a little bit of that is going to help you with other exercises. The other one that I always mention is using a, a singing straw. This is just a regular metal straw for like a young coconut. Um, so smaller diameter is kind of what's most important, a really thick straw or, you know, like a really big sort of op open straw is going to be harder to support because the concept is, is about smaller spaces, but you can do the same kind of thing. You can go like, and it's going to actually help you stabilize your vocal fold. So that's especially for someone who is coming back into this and feeling very breathy, like, feels like the air is just sort of escaping out of here. Um, again, what happens is people start to try and squeeze with these muscles to stabilize it. And that's where you run into issues. We actually, the vocal mechanism, the best way for this to happen is that the resonance stabilizes the vocal fold. So that's why I'm such a big fan about talking about resonance um, and really getting people to hear and perceive what resonance is. Um, it's essentially when everything is lined up, we get synchronized motion and all of the frequencies are boosting off of each other and amplifying and amplifying. So it's like pushing someone on a swing is a great example, right? You give the right push uh, and you have resonance, which is kind of like the swing part of it, then it will just kind of keep going uh, without you having to muscle it. If you try to muscle it the whole time, you're actually stopping the motion. So this is why this is kind of confusing. That's sort of the best way I can explain the sensation that we're going for. Um, so again, using like the straw, using like a Z or just basic vowels and gently going up and down, like, uh, 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 and you're going to feel maybe this is going to want to come up and down. Same thing. Just try to kind of keep this flexible and move your head and your neck around and just teach these external muscles that they're not really involved actually with this process. Um, Oh, I, I skipped one thing that I just wanted to point out. Uh, some people, we, you know, it's, it's also very common um, as we're doing this and you get lots of sort of flack, you might run into sort of some chronic coughing issues or throat clearing, right? So if you find yourself clearing your throat a lot, you're going to want to slow down, try to do it more with resonance as well to kind of clear things out. And there's one more trick that I haven't really talked about yet. Uh, also, because a lot of these sounds are a little a little strange, so bear with me. Um, there's another way that you can kind of clear out mucus uh, without harming the vocal folds, right? And so we harm it when we strike at it and we like <coughs> anything like that, smacking, that's going to be an issue or like <coughs> any sort of grind. But what we can use is, um, and this is from kind of borrowing from some other languages, like an ich or an ach, um, and I like to use the word like key and i'm going to go and you can hear that it sort of sounds like a, a cat almost hissing but what's really happening is we're helping to kind of 
uh, break some of that stuff off if you have that. And again, this is just from experience, knowing a lot of um, different singers and different moments in our in our life. Uh, so as you know, again, if you sometimes like you know, people will stop singing. For, you know, they sang as a child, as a kid, and then stop singing for like twenty or thirty years, and then feel really called back into it. And that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Uh, and I'm always like, go for it. There's some things that hold people back, right? Like that sort of sound. And so I'm literally just getting people to slow down and do this more until they get that clear sensation. So again, you can go like, I know it's a very weird sound. Um, it's like I'm going, you know, you know, here when people are clearing their throat, it's a classic sort of sound. Then <coughs> the air cough and then swallow and then go back to. Eventually, the vocal folds can start to come together better. Um, you're going to get more of that resonance. So when we hear sort of a, a raspy sound, sometimes our uh, tendency is to try to push into it. And that's actually going to just get us the wrong feeling. So it's all about this trying to rush kind of a concept, which I get is frustrating. But, you know, you can spend like at first... 15 minutes a day or less um, touching with your voice and start to kind of build it from there. Uh, again, the muscles are very small and uh, they're moving many hundreds of times per second, uh, If you know, especially as you go up into your higher register. So conditioning it in small increments is actually going to be really, really healthy for the voice. Give yourself that time. Um, sometimes we don't always have that time, but in general, pacing yourself and, you know, once you start to notice that you're starting to muscle it and strain, you're switching into a different state and you're not letting the body sort of uh, handle things. And so that's when I usually stop. Sometimes you can practice throughout the day, you know, do it for a little bit, get to a point, stop, come back to it like three or four hours later, see where it's at, pay attention to your energy levels. Um, that really matters too. So that's that concept, throat clearing. It's a very weird thing, I know. Um, but I just had to show it because I think it's actually really helpful, um, especially if you're someone who feels like there's just like a lot of stuff getting in the way. To do this kind of practice just like that. You can do like five or 10 minutes of that in the shower, especially where there's steam. It's going to be really helpful to kind of loosen and relax the muscles. So there's a reason again, why it's like singing in the shower. Like we have good feedback, you know, cause it's a echoey often with like a tile or something like that. Uh, and the steam is kind of the only, uh, you know, when we drink tea and stuff like that or hot water, it goes through the other tube, um, the esophagus. And so when we're trying, uh, when you know, when we're trying to get hydration in this area, it often takes extra time, right, for it to get to actually to our vocal folds and to the um, to the windpipe. And so, steam is actually a really great way to feel some release. Um, also, just the hot water is nice, of course, but that actually can help to hydrate and nourish uh, your voice. In fact, there are some some products that are essentially like a nebulizer. People use this when they go on planes and things like that. If you're feeling a lot of dryness and a lot of buildup of like hard mucus, um, they'll they'll use that if they're going, you know, traveling a lot on tour. So you'll see that actually all the time. And it's just to keep everything hydrated and healthy. Um, so highly recommend looking into that if that's something that you're struggling with. Because uh, again, my whole thing is like, I want us to get back into it in a really smooth way and to enjoy that process, but it takes a little bit of momentum. Um, and so simple exercises that cause us to not overwork and not to try too hard. It's one of the try not try. It's a very frustrating thing with the voice. Um, so once we've done some of that kind of stuff, then we can get into some vocal conditioning. So this is where we're actually thinking about the buildup of pressure and our consonants are going to really help us with this. So essentially SOVT is a fancy singing word, right? Um, it's just a fancy term for when your mouth is closed or the tract is slightly closed off partially, uh, that we can build up pressure and work with that better. So this is when then I go through this process where I try to watch out for a couple of things. If I'm not building up pressure in my belly and my back, these muscles are going to start to engage. And the classic thing will happen for most people is your head and your neck is going to come out of alignment. It's essentially trying to make the space smaller to help us support the sound. But that's, you can tell that's going to have a lot of issues ultimately, right? Is we're not going to get the right kind of resonance that we need, um, or we're going to feel stuck and tight. So you can see tension throughout the day, having tech neck, all of these things actually can really affect the voice. And so go back to stretching and trying to find some alignment and release here. It's, it's going to really actually go a long way without you having to 
muscle out a bunch of exercises. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And please um, stop me if you have more questions. Uh, this is this is really just, you know, this space is to kind of like interact with all of you and figure out like, you know, what do you do to help get your voice up and running? Um, so we're gonna, um, you know, this is this classic concept. I like to use simple, um, simple syllables. It's so like ma or na. We'll talk about the ng as well, ng or ga. Um, and what we do is when our mouth is closed, we can feel the buildup of pressure, like. Remember it's that thing where I was moving up and down so I can really hear when there's resonance. Sometimes it's like hard to perceive if there's resonance. Um, and so we hear it a lot in the transition. So that's what I'm kind of showing people is like. The resonance is a sign that you've created the right sort of stability with pressure underneath that sort of push of the swing and you're creating and your, your body's sort of finding the right sort of alignment and space to, uh, to get resonance to activate. And so again, the SOVT sort of concept is that when our mouth is closed, it's easier to find that. Uh, and then as we open up into our uh, vowel, that's when we tend to have most of our habits. So we're just trying to watch out for this. People tend to over support consonants sometimes in anticipation. Hi, welcome. And they go like, hmm, right. And we try to squeeze, but this is really just a position here. So we're very, very light with our upper body. It's like, hmm, my lips are just barely draped. I have internal space. Hmm, ah, ah, ah. And I'm trying to keep that resonance going as my mouth opens, my body's gonna have to support a little more. Sometimes it's really hard to feel. But we notice it more by sensation of locking. If we're not, if it's not supporting enough, these things happen. Um, instead of forcing it, you just go back to try and stimulating the muscles. So I'll do like, or that like, ha, 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 ha. Doing like staccato kinds of things can really help people get that. Like, ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. I'm not even worried about specific targets so much yet. And then, ma, ma, ma. And I'm feeling my body drop down, create pressure, and everything start to relax here. So I'm just checking in. It's kind of like car maintenance, you know? It's like checking in, making sure that my, my voice is doing things the right way, that I'm not trying to rush the process and over engage and force it into position. Um, so, you know, one thing that I might do is actually go over uh, all of my consonant shapes. And I like to do this as a drone as well. And it's in some of my other things uh, when I talked about like vowels and consonants and our basic building blocks for our voice, right? What do we sing on consonants and vowels? That's why a lot of the exercises are designed the way that they are. Um, it's just, that's the mechanism. Like that's what the body knows how to do is create these sound shapes because how we talk and how we do other things. And so that's actually the way that we exercise our voice is finding the right shapes that help bring our, our voice into balance and different voices need sort of a slightly different concoction to, to sort of find something that's well-rounded. So um, I'll go through things like this and um, this might be fast, but again, there's other uh, lessons on this, especially also on the website where it really takes you through this slowly. Uh, but I'm gonna do lip consonants and go like, Ma ba pa wa. And I'm trying to keep the essentially the resonance, that sort of ball of energy floating in the vowels in between these consonants. And I'm making sure that I don't ma ba, kind of stop my breath and start squeezing inward. So I'm trying to ride it out like ma ba pa wa. And if I do that right, each time it comes together, it's going to give me a little bit of forward energy uh, because that's just how consonants work. So I'm doing this kind of like a drone too. I'll be like, ma, ba, pa, wa. And you're going to feel that activity, especially when you do things like, p, 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 right? Because it's sort of like a puff of air. And uh, I kind of sandwiched that one internally because, or in, inside the exercise because it's a little hard. Um, Ah, yeah, yeah, the lip trill thing, right? You know, it's funny, I like purposefully don't do a lot of lip trill stuff just based on what I hear um, with a lot of uh, 
a lot of students, it's a very helpful mechanism, but it kind of actually requires certain things to already be connecting appropriately. Like we need a certain amount of release with our facial muscles, as well as a connection with our belly and our back. So that's very similar to another SOVT style exercise. In fact, I mean, it is an SOVT style exercise. Um, just like zzz, but the answer to your question is essentially if you're trying to do it too much with your face, it's actually going to stop because you don't have that engine of, of pressure underneath. So you can actually do lip trills without even uh, singing or phonating You can go like, and again, I'm kind of doing the pulsing thing that I do with any other exercise. Like, I call this the lawnmower exercise for obvious reasons. It kind of sounds like you're kind of doing that sort of thing. Um, sometimes also if you're, if it's, there's a little too much friction here, as in if your lips are too dry, it'll stop the, the lip trill. Lip trills are kind of like learning to whistle. You kind of have to fiddle around with them for a bit. And even doing it for a few seconds can be helpful. But essentially, I'll, I'll often lick my lips first and then... The other thing I would say is what's complex about it and why I kind of compare it to whistling is we do have to bring our lips, often for a lot of people, a little forward and together. Kind of like you're going into a slightly kissy face. and purse it for the lips to be close enough for this sort of effect to start happening. Um, it's essentially like we're creating the pressure and the lips start um, start vibrating because the pressure is very similar actually to kind of what happens with the vocal folds, but just in a slightly different place. So I would also consider doing gentle sirens or sort of revving the engine as this concept, right? So going like, it starts and stops that's totally fine um often doing other sovt style exercises will help you unlock your lip trills but i don't lead with this i mean it for for a lot of professional singers it's a very fast way to activate the voice just like uh, using a singer straw it just gets the whole thing connected we have the slightly closed space which helps us uh, align the muscles in the right way and working on mixing and all of these things but I kind of think of it as a slightly more uh, intermediate to advanced technique, actually, because it requires muscle isolation. For some, they can do it naturally, and it just helps them get the right feeling for singing. So that's why I think a lot of people use that as like a trick. Uh, but it's not for everybody. So and that's kind of my point is that's just one trick in our tool belt. Uh, and every sort of trick has pros and cons to it. So some of them might be this feeling of kind of getting a little stuck with the lips or a little tight in the jaw, um, as with a lot of SOVT exercises. So it's one aspect of it. Uh, but you're, you're not, um, you're not alone in that. That's actually very, very common. And I think for a lot of singers, cause it's sort of a silly sound and, you know, if you, yeah, I don't know if you've ever done slow-mo with it, but it's kind of a ridiculous thing. Um, it kind of discourages people sometimes, or it can be a little off-putting. So I wait till a little later and that's totally fine. There's other ways to get these muscles stimulated. Um, so I'll, again, I'll start doing exercises where I'm just moving up and down and I'm starting to feel the difference in pressure. I call this sort of the active passive component of singing. Um, so I'll have like two notes, like a fifth apart. And one of them is, is fairly engaged. And then the other one is going to be a little more breathy. So ma, ma. a lot of the times people over sing in their lower register they're trying to carry sort of the feeling down, like, ma, ma, and we call this pressing. You're actually using too much pressure, and there's this feeling of the rebound of the voice. We can actually sort of flow on and off of our pressure, and that's what I call dynamic support, and it's what makes for smooth singing in general. Um, so, ma, 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 ma. Eventually, you can do it rather quickly, but give yourself some time early on. Um, so, you know, I'll play around with this and move it around and be like, mm, mm, ma, ma. always just trying to stay grounded. So again, your temptation might be to go mm, and immediately do this. That's just going to set you in the wrong direction. So move your head, give those muscles another job. So it's like, mm, ma, 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 ma. we develop stability this way. Now, 
over time you do enough conditioning exercises and you're start probably going to start to have a little bit of fatigue or strain. It's like, think of it like other muscles. It's okay to get just a little bit of fatigue because it means you're conditioning the muscles. That's why I kind of call it that. But once you go past that point and you start overdoing it, then you're not actually really helping. Uh, and then the body has to go a little more into recovery mode. So it's this cycle of coming on and off of your voice. That's why, again, you know, just mentioned for this whole topic, it's really good sometimes to take a break on, you know, uh, allow your voice to sort of decompress. Uh, it can be a long time, actually, especially if you're someone who, um, you know, has been working at it really, really hard, uh, just to reset the palate, kind of um, come back to it with a fresh sort of uh, sensation is going to really, really help help you a lot of the time because that's where a lot of our habits are in the process of trying to build the voice up and sort of pushing it. Um, my teacher back in the day, and I love saying this, and I'll say it a million times, when the note becomes available to you because then you're you're speaking the body's language. You're listening and you're paying attention. When you're starting to do a lot of this, it's just a sign, like just like in any other athletic thing, if you start using your muscles in a slightly wild, less graceful way, it's a sign that you're getting, getting to kind of muscle failure. It's hard to notice with the voice. So some people will cross that line rather easily. And that's when people always ask me, like, how often should I sing for it? I'm like, it really depends on where you are in your practice and what you're doing and what it feels like. And so I have to kind of do it on a case by case basis. Yeah, we can sort of get general ideas of like, 15 to 20 minutes of warm ups. If you're a professional, you can, you know, or you're really working on extra concepts and drills, you could go for like an hour or so much past that. And it's maybe a little too much actually. Um, but again, you know, I get it. Cause especially a lot of professionals, we have to, we have to get a lot of stuff down. So we do a lot actually just with our ear kind of listening skills and then try to apply our voice into it rather strategically. Cause again, the muscles are small. And there's a limit to what any human can do with their voice. And once you start feeling that, then you want to start uh, resting appropriately. And sometimes people go on vocal rest. They actually will just, you know, stop talking for a while. All of these kinds of things can be helpful if you're, um, if you're trying to push it too quickly, right? So I, there's so many times with students where we get to the cycle and I can just tell that they're overdoing it. And I, my answer to them is you need to stop for a little bit, reapproach it um, because you're just getting stuck in sort of a vicious cycle. Um, and you'll feel it. And, and oftentimes we know, and then we push past it. So I would just say, use your intuition on these kinds of things. You're your best sort of guide ultimately. And as a teacher, I like to tell people that too, that like, um, you have to pay attention to what it feels like because only you truly know. I mean, I can see certain things obviously and hear them. Um, but we can hide a lot of things and, um, being honest with yourself like that, it's actually going to be the process to really opening and unlocking the voice. Once it's kind of functioning, it, it feels really light and effortless, but it takes a little bit of time to get there. And that's where we, that muscling sort of thing starts to happen. Um, so again, you know, na and ma and all of these kinds of things are going to help us start to feel out our high notes. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is especially for the lower voice singers, um, you know, and culturally, a lot of male singers in general, we don't use our head voice very often. So you're going to want to spend some time there. Even if you're like, I'm never going to sing up there. I don't do that. I don't talk up there. It helps you with your high belty range. It helps you with mixing. And so I would go up into this register and we're going to use like a G, right? It's good for chord compression. So a lot of times what happens is people go, Ki -ki. that sound is things are not coming together and our supports were coming off of that sort of pressure system. It's just a fun sort of trick just for a second to pay attention to this one. Like when you hold your breath, if I take a breath like diaphragmatically, you see, actually you'll feel it and you'll see that the vocal folds come together and seal a little bit to hold our breath. Um, so in the same thing when we do glottals, like uh, uh, it kind of closes and then creates a little pressure and then backs up. We can use this to start to feel a little bit of our chord compression. For some people, if you're over squeezing, it's the opposite thing. You actually want to avoid that. So this is where it gets confusing. You have to really pay attention to what your voice is doing and what its tendencies are. Um, but I'll do something like this. So again, if the voice type is like going like that. I'm turning my attention to my support and feeling and using that G to get more and more stability and to start boosting those overtones. Also, the E vowel is going to start to look taller. So if you're 
Ski. That's not the right alignment for the way the shape of the larynx or the way the shape of the pharynx should be. So ki, 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 ki. it's kind of like a tall stretch. There's lots of exercises that I do to try and feel that out. So it looks a little more like an ah, ah, a, e, e, a, ah. It's actually more of the tongue in the back that does this. So that's why it's so great to work on all of those glides and things like that when we're just kind of trying to get sort of tongue mobility are releasing that from what the jaw is doing. So these are all fair game, especially when you're starting out again. Um, I realized that I, uh, in just sort of the passion of things, I skipped a couple of things with the consonants and I wanna go back and just sort of remind people of this because it's so helpful when you're starting out again. Um, so we did right like, um, ma, ba, pa, wa, these lip consonants. I wanna talk about tongue, to hard palate consonants, because I think this is where a lot of that jaw and tongue tension starts to kind of happen. So this is why it kind of came back into my brain. Uh, the practice is very cyclical like this, so it's totally fine if you're a little out of order. It just pay attention to what part of the voice is sort of kind of floundering, and then try and do some exercises just to help that part. Um, so with this one, we have ta da la na ra, and the temptation here is to go. Ta da la na ra, and that's you know some of that's going to happen, but in general, if we can keep this pretty relaxed and separate the two things out, it's helping um, strengthen the mechanism, and it's also making sure that we don't pull anything out of alignment because often the jaw and all of these you know and that sort of back of the neck it's all connected and it just gets really rigid. So I'm trying to find just this really smooth way of doing this, especially as we sing higher, it's going to really help. But I'll go like. Ta da la na ra. And this is all the SOVT thing. So every time n na na, I'm feeling that buildup of pressure and listening for that resonance. And it's a sign that I've gotten to the right place. If it's out of shape, it'll be like n na. Right. Often people will. Um, not pitch their consonants appropriately. It's actually where a lot of um, like tuning issues happen. People are like, nah. And then often we start to try and reach to get back up to that note. So this is, you'll see that exact process. It's like, nah, nah. And then this thing happens, right? So that's what we're trying to work against. So um, I will work that down here and go like, Ta -da -la -na -ra. And then I'll use like an N, M and N and N, G are kind of the, the, the smoothest and easiest ones to sort of connect to. And so we're going like, na, 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 na. And I'm just calibrating how much pressure do I need too much and you're pressing too little and you're going to start to do this kind of thing and crumple. So. Na 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 na. And I, you know, play around with this all sorts of shapes, right? It might be like na 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 na. And again, you might find yourself going na 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 na. So strength and stability. It's one aspect of the voice. Doing this plus sirens and stretching, and you're going to start to get a lot of ease with your voice. Um, so, you know, I also, one thing I would mention is as you're doing this for anybody, but especially starting up again and sensations are a little hard, use your hands, use a mirror, look at yourself, or at least, um, you know, with a teacher that's often, you know, just providing feedback, you know, are you aware that you're doing this one thing every time you go to sing a high note and your shoulders coming up? Um, so I'm always just trying to kind of watch for that because that's what I'm watching for internally as well. They start to be these synchronized patterns that we want to break. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's good to be a little silly again too, right? We, we get a little too serious, but um, our sound, we can make a lot of sound shapes with our voice and we can use them for comedy things to help work our voice um, for, you know, sometimes in certain kinds of cool choral textures, we use interesting sounds. Um, so yeah, I enjoy that for sure. Uh, but it also just helps us remember, right? Um, so again, what I'm focusing on here is making sure that I mm, don't do any squeezing, but oh, let's see it right here. No, no, no. And I get that nice clean transition of resonance. So I hear 
no, 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 no. I'm trying to minimize the motion. There's going to be a little bit, right? But uh, we want to minimize it. Um, same thing with doing like NGs, right? Going like. No. No. And you can see even in this process, right? I haven't done like a lot of singing today. And in this process, you can hear it starting to kind of fill out and just get a much more solid sound. If that's what you're going for, that type of conditioning is just going to get you ready for doing all of your songs. And this leads me to the next thing, which is what do I do with songs and how do I get back into the swing of them? Again, a lot of the times what happens is people want to go to their hardest songs and just to see if it's there. And that's often kind of the wrong move, right? Is start with gentle routes and, you know, as, you know, simple songs, your, your easier go-to songs, or take a song that's high. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the registration. Like if you're doing a lot of mixing, it can make it in a slightly awkward spot. But we play around with changing the key. Um, and there's lots of uh, karaoke websites and play, things like that that will actually help you transpose or lower the key. And then you can, you know, you can get a sort of a guide track and, and drop it down a little bit to a place where you're not starting to reach and strain. And that's going to help you actually build the voice back appropriately. Again, if you're starting to reach and strain a lot, you're going to get into this cycle of having to recover. And that sometimes can take longer than you would think, you know, it's like with a lot of athletic things, it's like everything's going great. And then you overextend yourself and you make that one, you know, stupid injury. And then you have to stay off of it for some weeks or, or so, right. Um, you know, I think as a general rule, like if you're feeling a little vocal fatigue, thinking like 36 hours, actually a little more than a day to let the voice rest and recover, check in with it. If it's still tired after that, that's a sign that you way overdid it. Right. Um, and so you're going to want to give yourself like like a week or so. And then, you know, from there, uh, if things are still bad, then, you know, there's a whole process of checking in with um, uh, like a laryngologist or someone uh, who specializes with that kind of stuff too, right? Because sometimes it's not about the exercises we're doing. There's other things that can be involved. Um, if you're feeling a lot of pain or anything like that, then like, that's actually like kind of an emergency in some ways. It's like, you know, I always remind people, like, if you suddenly went blind, like you'd be freaked out. Um, and if all of a sudden you really can't use your voice at all, um, that could be a sign that you've you've done something that actually needs more immediate care. And so we, I have a whole um, thing that I did a while back on vocal health, uh, and I recommend kind of taking a look at that if that's you, of course. Um, but just to be mindful of that, that like um, that's why I'm so cautious about this. If you do things in the wrong way, you can you know just like with anything in the body, you can injure yourself, uh, and sometimes it can be harder to feel with our voice we notice it with the sound and how our voice can be used. So, you know, if you're uh, that kind of stuff, like that's, that's a sign that there's, there's something going on and it's worth it to take a, you know, get someone to take a look at it. Um, oftentimes they'll do things like a, a stroboscopy or something where they'll take really quick pictures of the vocal folds. Um, and so you can see things that are happening as they're coming together. It's really a fascinating thing, but the, the technology has advanced actually, if you're someone who's um, heard about this stuff back in the day, um, so yeah, good, good, good. So this whole thing, it's all about it, it sort of, um, it, we work into a flow and it all culminates. And then I swear, like I'm, you know, I'm someone who sings, can sing very, very loud and like, you know, a lot of power, um, but it's through efficiency and it feels light. And that's what allows me to do that. Actually, even we sometimes want to imitate a big sound, uh, but actually the, the, the power is through precision and amplifying and boosting resonance. And once you get that sweet spot, like it just starts opening and building and building. And then you feel your whole self expand out into the room. And then you're like, whoa, I've got a, I've got a big voice, you know. So uh, less is more. Uh, patience is is power. All of these kinds of things that I like to say a lot because they're, again, things that I have to remind myself of. Um, just to remind you again, weight train your songs. You can take them down a little lower and then you can bump them back up bit by bit. In some cases, this can be hard. Uh, in other cases, it can be just the right kind of move. If you can't do that with a song, then just try to find some other stuff, you know, like um, something that helps you ease your way into your voice, just like anything else as we, we enjoy it. And if we're not forcing ourselves, then uh, magical things happen and your, your body and your voice is going to respond to that in a healthy way. So we can sometimes be a little split brain and be a little abusive on our, our voice. And I just always tell people, be patient, love your voice, 
treat it with respect, even if it's not behaving the way that you want it to, right? Because these things happen and then we're like, oh, I do not like the sound of my voice. But that actually has a big effect, right? You know, I I think of it more like right now my voice is feeling different and odd and I need to give it a little extra love and pay attention to it. So that's the practice actually. And then, yeah, and then you can actually start working on songs and stuff like that um, and do all of these other things. But when you're thinking about your voice, think about it like this from mechanics. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I hope you guys all have a good rest of the day. And um, again, it's not a scary thing to take a break. It's actually a good thing. Um, ah, hot drinks. Uh, yeah, this drink stuff. Yeah, you know, generally, um, if you know, always within reason, it's a balanced thing. But generally, warmer things are going to be better than colder things. That's what a lot of people talk about. When it's cold, we tend to kind of um, paralyze things a little bit, right? They're a little sort of slow. That's why people have the scarf around the neck, right? It's a classic sort of singer thing is like, keep your throat warm, um, you know, or gloves for a piano player, like these kinds of things. It doesn't matter, actually. I've been in some cold places and had to play piano or guitar and been like, ooh, this is like not as flexible as I was hoping it would be. Um, so yes, hot drinks can be can be nice. Um, they don't have as much of a, an immediate effect except for maybe like perception, right? It's like maybe somewhat uh, influencing the other side, but it's really just going down our esophagus, right? So um, part of it, I think, is just the general relaxation, hydration of this part of our, our vocal tract can be really helpful. Um, so yeah, I'd say play, play around with it ultimately when I'm dealing with any questions about like food and um, and uh, liquids and things like that. The best thing is just to test it out and see how your body responds. Um, weird things happen. Like sometimes like green tea can be kind of drying for my voice. Um, whereas I don't really have as big of an issue with certain things that people are like terrified about. Like, oh no, I had some cheese or milk. And um, I'm like, well, I'm fine if I just do some of that humming and stuff and make sure that my throat is clear and then I'm not worried about it. Right. So, uh, yeah, I would just like, you know, with my general rule is don't try anything super new, uh, before a performance, always vet things, right. If you have like a certain kind of, um, cough remedy or thing like that, you always want to vet these things way in advance, uh, if you can, right. Because you just don't know what the effect is going to be on your body necessarily. So, um, yeah. So anyways, this is a gentle approach today, right? It's about getting back into the swing of things. And the, the answer again is be slow, be methodical, listen to your body uh, and your voice, and then proceed from there and try some of these exercises out and see if they help you. And if you're still struggling, you know, get back into the swing of things with a teacher. That's always a great thing, right? Teachers, at least the way I see myself is helping people move forward and accelerate their process because I've seen it with a lot of people been through it myself. Um, and that just helps you, you know, have you use your time efficiently, right? So you don't get stuck in certain things that aren't necessarily helping you. Um, so it's always great to have a guide. And um, I will leave it at that. So I think Camille is going to be taking uh, next week, I was just filling in for today. But I will see you all in a few weeks with some new topics. Take care, everyone have a good rest of the day.